Hi everyone and welcome to tonight's webinar, Biogas Hazards, Dirty Air, Factory Farms, and Climate Change. Tonight we're going to cover the build out of, the bio, of biogas in the industry, what it actually means for people, farming, and climate. We're going to answer your questions and talk about how you can get involved. My name is Rebecca Wolf with Food and Water Watch and Food and Water Action. We're going to get started in just a minute, but I want to give everyone another minute to hop on. If you are at a computer, we highly recommend clicking the link to the screen share. You'll be able to see us and then we're going to be sharing some presentation slides throughout as well. You can also easily ask questions through the program we're using called Zoom, but we will email around the recording to everyone who signed up in the beginning. I can see we have a lot of folks hopping on and we know that this is a highly anticipated webinar, so we're going to dive in in just one minute. All right, welcome everyone to the Biogas Hazards, Dirty Air, Factory Farms and Climate Change webinar. We're gonna get started in just a minute. We're gonna dive in and hear all about the build out of the biogas industry. My name is Rebecca Wolf and I am the, an organizer at Food and Water Watch and Food and Water Action. And we have a really fantastic lineup of speakers with us tonight who I'm actually gonna introduce in just no, a moment. On these calls every week. But thank you all for joining. Um, we'd also like to thank our allies and partners who have co-sponsored this important conversation, including Iowa Citizens for Community Improvement, the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy, Center for Food Safety, Public Justice, Friends of Family Farmers, NC Warren, Leadership Council, North Carolina Environmental Justice Network, and the Associated Association of Irritated Residents, also known as AIR. Before we get started again, I just wanna give a quick orientation if you're joining us via Zoom. This will be a good time to mention that if you aren't joining us on ScreenShare, we do highly recommend doing that by clicking the link in your email. And we're here on video, we'll be sharing slides throughout the webinar as well. We wanna keep everyone on mute to cut down on background noise. So we'll be taking questions throughout. If you do have questions though, um, at any point in the presentation, you can click on the Q&A button in the bottom of the screen and we'll get to as many of those as we can throughout and also at the end of the webinar. I'll also note that we're not using the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. So again, please click that Q&A if you want to ask a question. You also have the opportunity to submit questions to our panelists beforehand. So we'll try to incorporate and answer some of those too um, at the end and throughout. If you have any technical questions or issues um, or you're joining us by phone and you do have a question, you can email us at help at fwaction.org. Again, that's help at fwaction.org. And we do have folks standing by to, to assist you and help you there. So right now in this country and abroad, fossil fuel companies and agribusiness are joining forces to sell us, quite frankly, a greenwashed nightmare. The idea that animal manure can be considered a renewable energy resource. In practice, manure digesters capture the methane from decomposing manure to create this biogas, which then can be used to produce electricity on site or move through natural gas pipelines. Now I'll mention that there are other types of biofuels. I know there are a lot of questions about that, like ethanol or biodiesel, that come up in this debate on products being considered renewable energy. And biogas can actually be made in several different ways, like breaking down food waste or crops in digesters, um, or trapping methane from landfills and sewage treatment plants. But tonight we're really gonna focus on just factory farm biogas and specifically why factory farm biogas is a false solution and why it won't address our climate crisis or intensifying factory farm problem. We know that we need to in invest in a just transition to 100% zero emission clean energy future, not the expansion of factory farms to promote this biogas. So with that, I'm gonna kick things off a little bit more with introductions and then I'm going to pass it to our panelists for tonight. They'll cover many topics, but they'll be bringing us through problems and into our solutions. So first we're gonna have Phoebe Seaton of Leadership Council. Phoebe, a native Californian, attended the University of California, Berkeley, where she received her BA, 
Then she spent some time in Guatemala working to address human rights violations and went on to complete her JD at the University of California, Los Angeles. In 2013, Phoebe co-founded Leadership Council with Veronica Garibay. Phoebe is based in Sacramento and leads the Leadership Council's state-level policy work. After that, we're gonna have Iowa Wilson. Iowa is Administrative Co-Director of the North Carolina Environmental Justice Network. He holds a BS in Communication, Electronic Media, and Broadcasting from Appalachian State University and a Master's in Public Administration, cum laude, from NC Central University. He serves on the Board of Directors for Haw Ri River Assembly and NC Warren, and on the leadership team of NC Climate Justice Collective. We also have Patty Lavera with us from Food and Water Watch. Patty is the Food and Water Policy Director with Food and Water Watch. She has over 20 years experience in environmental and agriculture policy and campaigns. She has a bachelor's degree in environmental science from Lehigh and a master's degree in env environmental policy from the University of Michigan. And finally, we're gonna have Dr. Mark Jacobson of Stanford University. Mark has focused on better understanding air pollution and global warming problems and developing large scale clean renewable energy solutions. He's also developed and applied three dimension dimensional atmosphere, biosphere, ocean computer models and solvers to simulate air pollution, weather, climate and renewable energy, as well as roadmaps for this transition, like in countries, states, cities and towns to 100% renewable energy. And finally, I just wanna mention that after IO Speaks, we're gonna play a short clip from Frida Keiniger of Food and Water Europe. She is a Brussels-based Food and Water Europe campaign officer promoting a ban on fracking in Europe. And after completing her master's thesis on intensive agriculture in Southern Spain, she became involved with issues concerning the European food system, as well as the transition to a sustainable energy system, community energy and questions of climate justice. Frida has also dealt with various food and energy issues in the context of EU institutions and Brussels NGOs. So I've only just summarized some of the incredible work and all of those accomplishments from our speakers. You know they're experts. Um, and I wanna thank them for all of their great work that they do every day on this and for especially being with us here tonight. So with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Phoebe from the Leadership Council to kick us off. Thank you, can you hear me? Great, um, thanks so much for that introduction and thanks to folks um, especially in other parts of the country who are, who are joining late um, this evening. I'll talk about, a little bit about um, our work in the, in the world of biomethane. So the, in, um, in, in short, the, there's been a huge effort in the state of California to subsidize the creation um, of methane, the subsequent capture of methane, and the um, the conversion of methane into gas for different purposes. The first, I think, first generation was for combustion, for electricity. Second generation was um, vehicle fuels. And now the idea is to create a gas that can be vehicle fuel gas or can be injected into the common carrier pipeline. Uh, so far, we've seen um, several hundreds of millions. I know that I'm missing a couple million or scores of million here or there, but the uh, Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, also called the Cap and Trade Fund, which is really um, designed and supposed to be building our resilience and um, an equitable and environmental just framework in terms of for, for climate change, has uh, contributed about $200 million to dairy digesters, which are the technology that creates this, um, kind of this, me this methane and gas manufacturing system. Um, in terms of the economics of the dairy digester, they really incentivize and subsidize large scale dairies, which is where initially our interest um, intersected. We work in California, San Joaquin Valley and Coachella Valley. Most relevant to this work is the San Joaquin Valley, which has some of the worst air in the country, some of the worst water in the country and dairies have been a, prime, a major contributor to both the air quality concerns and the water quality concerns. The, um, the digesters really are touted by the, the manufacturers and a kind of a, a quick sidebar in our learning around, um, learning around digesters, we've learned that the vast majority of the money, which um, again, is hundreds of million dollars for the development and then an additional 
looking like right now, our count is at about $360 million in ratepayer subsidies for operations um, going to two companies um, that, that the real, the incentives and the sub subsidization uh, is targeting large dairies and actually incentivizes the further concentration of cows. The San Joaquin Valley is not only home to some of the worst air quality and water quality, but the most disadvantaged communities from a kind of demographic income perspective. So what you have is the overlay of, of dairies of extraordinarily kind of contaminating and polluting land uses concentrated near lower income communities. Um, and then this very large kind of subsidy scheme incentivizing the further kind of the further the, not just the um, increased kind of viability, but the actual growth and concentration of those dairies in, long, in, in lower income communities impacted by air quality and, and, and water quality. Um, I think the, so our kind of on the, the salt in the wound as well is that the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund also is designed to incentivize, as I mentioned before, the um, do dollars that benefit lower income communities. And many of these digester projects are um, characterized as beneficial to disadvantaged communities. So we took a, a little bit of a deeper look into that piece of it in particular and into how the digester developers were able to kind of justify those investments that which again is really investments in very, very large scale dairies designed to capture methane um, and produce gas, um, how those could be characterized as beneficial to disadvantaged communities. And we saw that there was a lot of um, manipulation of data and in fact some actual some data some some research that has been retracted um, due to um, kind of improper relationships between the researchers and the industry to, um, around the impacts of digesters on water quality so we've we've um, hopefully been able to call into question the proposed beneficial beneficial impacts or benefits of digesters to lower income communities and communities of color um, in the San Joaquin Valley, but the, the developers and the applicants for the state funds continue to kind of highlight these projects as, as quadruple bottom line, um, beneficial to everybody. Um, we did have a, uh, hopefully not short lived, but a small victory today. We're just in the middle of determining how this year's allocation of cap and trade funds will go um, and the Senate side, so one of the one of the sides of the legislature in California, um, decided to not, or in their proposal, they are not allocating funds for the first time in several years um, to digesters. Um, so we'll we'll continue to fight and hope that we can maintain that um, and keep keep and and our our a lot of our argument is if we have hundreds of millions of dollars to put into climate and agriculture there are better ways to do it than projects that um, are really designed to um, reinforce our dependence on the nat on natural gas that's it for me Perfect. Thank you, Phoebe. Um, I just want to give folks a quick reminder that we will be keeping this recording out if you're just joining us, as well as any additional resources. If you have any questions about any of that, digesters, what's going on in California, what the Leadership Council is working on, pop them in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen, and hopefully we'll get to them at the end. But if not, we're going to make sure that you get an answer um, afterward as well. So now I'm actually going to turn it over to Aya Wilson of the NC Environmental Justice Network. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, the North Carolina Environmental Justice Network is a grassroots people of color led coalition of community organizations and their supporters who work with low income communities and people of color on issues of climate, environmental, racial, and social injustice. Now, as the second largest pork producer in the country, the hog industry has been and remains an integral component of North Carolina's economy. Over the last three decades, the industry has undergone a major shift. Though the numbers of producers in the state has declined, the hog population has increased from about 2 million in 1982 to around 10 million currently. 
that shift is a result of a system adopted by industrial producers in North Carolina that involves raising large numbers of hogs and confinement structures that emit toxic gases and particles into the environment. These confined animal feeding operations, or CAFOs, are predominantly concentrated in low-income communities and communities of color of the state's eastern coastal plain, where corporations are lured by pro-business tax incentives, lax environmental regulations, and minimal oversight, and they encounter little pushback from community residents. This low-lying region, with a legacy of post-slavery settlement, has sandy soils and shallow aquifers, and is vulnerable to flooding, and now has the top 10 ranked counties for numbers of hogs per land area in the entire country. The defining characteristics of a confinement operation is the concentration and maintenance of animals in a designated area for 45 or more days of the year. This method allows growers to produce more animals using less space, making it increasingly lucrative for hog producers. But the concentration of animals necessarily results in the concentration of their waste. While smaller diversified farms have, have traditionally and sustainably used animal waste as fertilizer, large scale CAFOs produce high concentration of massive amounts of waste, too much waste for too small a space. That waste is stored in, in large pits called lagoons and later sprayed on neighboring fields. This practice releases hazardous gases into the environment, polluting the air, spreading odor and causing illness. Hog waste consists of a number of hazardous components, including ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, carbon monoxide, methane, antibiotic residues, and pathogenic bacteria, all those good things that people love. Studies have consistently linked the mixture of components produced by CAFOs to respiratory illness and disease. The waste in lagoons leaches into the groundwater, contaminating the local water supply with nitrates, disease-causing bacteria, and hormones and antibiotics from the fortified feed. The runoff from CAFOs adds excessive amounts of ammonium, nitrates, and phosphorus to downstream bodies of water, producing algae blooms and depleting oxygen. This effect is magnified with the frequency of hurricanes and severe weather events. Living near CAFOs affects mental health as well. Neighbors have reported greater depression and anxiety, sleep disorders, and higher stress levels. The system that exists in North Carolina and many other states exists without a true environmental justice lens on this industry. The overwhelming evidence of CAFOs being located in and near communities of color and low-income communities is not by mistake, it is by design. A system built on white supremacy deserves a comprehensive, safe, equitable, just transition, not one built on squeezing profit out of human suffering and one that doesn't prey on neighbors based on skin color. Biogas isn't a solution as it stands right now because it fails to provide a complete remedy and it threatens further entrenchment of an industry that consciously operates on white supremacy and destructive capitalism. Thank you. Thanks, Ayo. Um, again, if you have any questions for Ayo Wilson, um, anything about you know, more of the situation in North Carolina where he is or the work that um, his group does, you can pop that in the Q&A and we'll continue to answer throughout. We also had some really good questions that were asked before um, and submitted before to the panel that um, we will elaborate on more at the end. So with that, we're actually going to um, play a clip now from our Food and Water Europe organizer, Frida, to talk about how this industry um, is not only here in this country, but, but global. My name is Frida Kinning. I'm working here in Brussels for Food and Water Europe, and I would like to give a very short overview about the role of biofuels in Europe and the European Union. Uh, it's important to mention that uh, biofuels are never mentioned alone. Uh, always in a pool with other alternative gases that are called low carbon gases, decarbonized, ga decarbonized gases, green gases, uh, and most of the time just summed up as renewable gases. At the same time, uh, when we talk about biogas specifically, uh, industry is happy not to mention where exactly that biogas would be coming from. Uh, there are def many different uh, feedstocks for biogas, for example, manure, sewage, sludge, crops, our food waste and so on. Uh, 
Um, but the industry is keeping silent about that and uh, tries to promote uh, extremely high volumes of biofuels that can never ever be created in a, in a sustainable way. The European Union should know better because they made a big mistake with the biofuels directive and they had to backpedal because they saw the many negative side effects that uh, the directive and the support for biofuels caused. But right now they try to repeat the very same mistake as they did uh, now with biogas. We also have a lot of forecasts and scenarios in almost all of which the role of fossil gas is declining to close to 0% and the role of renewable gases is rising drastically. What nobody can tell us is how the high volumes of renewable gases can be produced in a sustainable way. What we are fearing is that renewable gases and especially biogas is just used by the industry as an excuse to continue business as usual, as an excuse to continue the build out of fossil fuel infrastructure and lock us into a fossil fuel future. With the silver bullet of renewable gases, the industry tells us that we can start changing in 2035 or later and right now continue just as we did with fossil gas. Countries uh, pushing especially for biogas are, for example, France or Italy, and also in Germany there is already a big amount of use uh, of biogas. At the same time, it's important to mention that the size of farms are not the same between the US and Europe, and the agricultural sector does show differences. Nevertheless, in the narrative and the ways uh, biogas is used as an excuse for the big industry to keep doing what they are doing. Uh, the US and Europe show very similar patterns. So it is really important to try and fight this alleged solution together. Great. I'm going to pass it off to Patty from Food and Water Watch to talk more about, touch on kind of that and talk more about the broken food system that we're working with here. Patty. Tricky unmute. And click. Let's see if some of our friends who are working on the tech can unmute Patty. It was going so smoothly, we had to hit this hiccup. <laughs> hmm. All right, we're going to switch it up. Mark, are you ready? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Mark Jacobson of Stanford to um, talk more about renewables. Okay, thanks. So I want to make the point that, you know, we're try we developed plans to transition cities and states and countries to just entirely clean and renewable energy. Uh, but you know, our, our goal is to eliminate not only emissions that affect climate, but also those that affect air pollution, uh, including, co so that really means all combustion emissions. So any type of biogas that's combusted is not compatible with a clean renewable energy future. So we need to go to electrify everything, basically. And the only type of gas might be hydrogen for long distance transportation. And that hydrogen would be produced from a fuel cell so unless it's hydrogen produced from a fuel cell or something that's electric, uh, it's not part of a clean renewable energy system. So our idea is to electrify all energy. And so that's transportation, heating, cooling, industry, agriculture, forestry, fishing. And so we will eliminate most emissions by doing that, most all emissions of air pollutants. And uh, we, and first of all, we're going to power that electricity with clean renewable energy, namely wind and water and solar power. And we will have to address non-energy emissions. And those non-energy emissions we do have uh, goals for, uh, but I just want to just focus on the energy right now. Uh, the energy, uh, so for each state in the U.S., we've developed a plan that would transition uh, the energy to just wind and water and solar power. Uh, and so all cars would be running on electric 
would be electric vehicles or hydrogen fuel cell for long distance. All heating, cooling would be uh, run on heat pumps, run on electricity. And uh, industry, industrial processes would be powered by electric devices such as arc furnaces, high temperature arc furnaces, uh, induction furnaces, resistance heaters, dielectric heaters. And so, and then all the electricity that we need for the industry, for uh, transportation, for heating would be powered by wind and water and solar power. So onshore and offshore wind, solar photovoltaics on rooftops and in power plants, concentrated solar power, geothermal, uh, tidal, small amounts of tidal wave and existing hydroelectric. So there's no room in this system. We find that we can keep the, we can power the entire US, for example, with just renewables uh, with no gas. We don't need gas, uh, to, we don't need to burn any gas. Uh, we would only combust, I'm sorry, we'd, we would not combust any gas, but we would just use electricity. And we've found that by doing this in the United States, we can not only reduce our power demand by on the order of 58% because of the efficiency of electrical devices, because we eliminate the energy in the mining, transporting and refining of fossil fuels and uranium. And because of uh, a slight end use energy efficiency improvements, our end use demand goes down 58%. And as a result, the cost of energy for, um, across the entire United States is on the order of half the cost of energy today in terms of direct energy costs. But because you know, in the United States there are 600, well, there are about 60,000 to 65,000 people die from air pollution, which is what we're trying to eliminate. And that costs the US about $600 billion per year in health costs. So we would eliminate that cost as well on, on top of half the energy cost. And we eliminate the climate emissions associated with fossil fuels and biofuels. Uh, by going to clean renewable energy. The net result, and I'll just give you a summary because this is really what the cost of the Green New Deal would be. Uh, right now, energy costs $2 trillion per year, all, to, all energy. And by, and then there's another $600 billion a year in health costs and $3.3 trillion a year in 2050 climate costs, if we take this forward to 2050, uh, from US emissions alone. So that's a total, of $5.9 trillion is the energy cost. And if we eliminate fossil fuels and biofuels, uh, we eliminate the health and climate costs and we eliminate half the energy costs, we go down to $1 trillion. So instead of 5.9 trillion, it's 1 trillion. So it's an 83% reduction in the cost of energy by going to clean renewable energy without biofuels, without, uh, without nuclear power, without any type of carbon capture or sequestration. So anyways, I want to just make that point that it saves money by actually just going to clean renewable energy. We do not want to just keep going with the combustion technologies because that's really what causes air pollution uh, in addition to residual climate impacts. So I'll stop right there. Great, I think that's a, that's a good spot there. Um, thanks for being able to jump in there, Mark. And <laughs> if you have any questions for Dr. Mark Jacobson about anything that he went over, Again, pop that in the question and answer, and we're also gonna um, go over some of that um, that you already submitted after Patty Lavera speaks. I'm going to switch spots with Patty <laughs> Lavera. She's gonna jump in here um, for the next couple of minutes to talk more about the food system, and then uh, we will then go into question and answer. So I am going to switch. Okay. Hi. <laughs> so I moved down the hall because my computer went on strike. So I am gonna talk a little bit um, about some of the context of how the, all these issues work together. Because um, we've had all these great presentations about why using factory farms to create biogas is a false solution and it's, it's greenwashing that we don't need. We have real problems to solve and this doesn't solve them. So the context we've heard about, we have factory farms, we have a problem um, and we have a climate problem that we need to deal with. These are big problems, they need big solutions. Biogas isn't it. Um, it takes us down a path of keeping our factory farms, dumping more money into them, and putting us further and further and further into the path of combustion, natural gas-based infrastructure. That's not what we need. That's the wrong direction. So I think you're looking at my slides, right? <laughs> um, and so I'm just going to real fast to talk about some of this context, right, of this national scale of the problem we have. And it's international as well, but we're 
for right now, for right now focusing nationally on the factory farm problem that we have. So our previous speakers talked about this. We have a problem of concentration in the way that we raise animals. So this is just a map that we've made to show that when we talk about factory farms, we're talking about concentrating animals in one place, and we're talking about concentrating industries in certain parts of the country. So we can jump to that next slide. Um, and that matters for a bunch of reasons. We heard real graphic examples uh, from North Carolina, from California, and it changes what it means to raise animals. We didn't always do it this way. We don't have to have factory farms. We didn't used to have factory farms. So we haven't had them forever. Like I always said, it's not an accident that we have them. We have them for a bunch of a bunch of reasons, including our farm policy and our economic structure for a bunch of things. And we also have them because we have failed to enforce environmental rules when it comes to these facilities. And it just one note of the many impacts that we have. We heard about, you know, water impacts, air impacts, public health, antibiotics, what it means to live next to these things, all of the injustice that brings. It also changes the economic structure of our farming systems. This is one example in Iowa from the 80s till the 2000s. We lost 80% of the hog farms in Iowa, but we're raising more hogs there because we're doing it on factory farms. So we can jump to that next slide. And so just to finish up, you know, kind of the context of these factory farms before we start talking about digesters, we've heard about the tremendous amount of waste that factory farms put in one place. So this is just one way to think about it. One county in Iowa has 12 million hogs and that equals the same amount of sewage that could come from, from Los Angeles. The difference is in Los Angeles, that amount of waste gets sewage treatment and the factory farm system, it doesn't. Digesters don't make that waste go away, right? They do one thing, they trap some of the gases that are there to either in the first generation, burn it for electricity in the second generation, put it into gas pipelines and double down on gas infrastructure and fossil fuels. So th these problems aren't gonna be solved of what to do with those, that solid waste, what it means to live next to these things just because you spend a ton of money building digesters on top of it. So we can go to that next slide. And these are not simple operations. So this is an aerial picture from the EPA of one of the earlier phases of a renewable natural gas facility in Missouri, Smithfield and a renewable energy, supposedly alternative energy company building it. They wanna put 88 lagoons on nine sites into this system to put gas into a pipeline for $120 million. So we can go to the next, um, next slide. So we see that these are complicated machines. They're expensive machines. We have lots of other stats about the costs of building these things. There's another example of one of these newer ones in North Carolina, where on one site, it's gonna cost $1.2 million to build a digester with a whole package of subsidies and credits to try to pay for it. Um, so they're expensive. It takes subsidies, it takes credits to do it. Every, lots of states have a renewable portfolio standard, about 30 states do, and 25 of those 30 states give credits, give green energy credit to energy that comes from animal waste. That's a perverse incentive. That's not the kind of incentive that we need. So we know that they're complicated. We know that they're expensive and we know that they're not going to get rid of factory farms. So this slide right here came off the EPA's website and the name of the site is anaerobic digestion right for your farm. And the answer is only if you're a pretty big farm with a lot of waste. These are big numbers and these are not the, not the transition we want to see in our food system. This is doubling down on factory farms if you're saying digesters are what we should be building. So we can, and in fact, Smithfield has said they're going to build new factory farms in Utah just to incorporate this renewable natural gas uh, technology into it. So it's not going to get rid of factory farms and in fact could bring us more. So just to wrap up, um, the last slide I can show is that, so if, who really wants these things, right? Communities don't want them. Um, it, the first generation didn't make a lot of sense economically. They don't really work without subsidies. So who is pushing for this technology besides the companies that sell you those pipes and fossil fuel companies that want to build the pipelines? And the answer is we have a lot of folks in our government who are real, real cheerleaders for this. This, this little graphic came from the EPA and the USDA who run a project together called AgStar and they just promote the hell out of digesters all the time and in fact help create these subsidies, publicize these subsidies and help individual sites put a package together to pay for these things. And so I think that's the kind of where a good, a good place to end. We've heard about specific subsidies in California. We just heard um, Mark talk about what we need to be doing in renewable energy. And we were talking about huge, huge amounts of money uh, that could be sunk into digesters and the pipelines to take the gas away and burn it. And we had much better things to do with that money. So if we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars for each site 
and there's thousands of sites, pipelines that cost millions of dollars per mile to build, to move gas around, that's a lot of money. And we have much better things to do with it, like fix the way that we raise animals and transition to renewable energy. So that's kind of the message we wanna leave, I think, leave on and then get to questions is that this is a false solution. We have real solutions, but biogas isn't one of them. So thanks. Perfect. All right. Switch. Yeah. We're switching. Um, <laughs> great. Thanks for, for bearing, with, um, bearing with us on that. And thanks uh, to Mark for being able to hop right in there. We're, we're doing it live. Um, so really quickly, before we get into questions, let me orient myself again here. Um, I wanted to mention again that we're going to be circulating um, an email after this that in you will find an organizational sign-on letter to oppose this biogas build out as a climate solution as it's being built right now. So please sign on behalf of your organization if you're in one and share with organizations that you know that should be joining us. Um, and we also are going to have a petition for individuals to sign as well to join us um, and help oppose biogas build out in your communities. Definitely also keep your eyes and ears peeled for these greenwash deals that you're gonna hear um, coming from, from potentially governments or, or companies and um, billing them as solutions in your communities if you're near capos and factory farms as well. Um, so with that, we have a number of questions I want to start getting to. And I think the first one I will ask um, is for Phoebe, if you are ready for me. <laughs> so question for you, Phoebe, is does converting emissions to biogas do anything to improve local air quality and reduce the nuisance impacts to nearby residents? Um, well, I'd love to answer this. I'd also love, if, I, I would love to hear other people's, the, the folks, other folks on this call and this webinar from our perspective. One of the big problems that I, I didn't get to, I'm sure others are, are facing this as well, is the lack of data transparency. So they, um, there's a lot of sharing of net numbers and whatever's convenient to the industry, um, but there isn't a lot of transparency in terms of like, we actually haven't even been able to, they are redacting the heads of cows um, on the dairies that receive funding as a trade secret. Um, but uh, so the, it's all a very long preface to say that the manure pits are a one piece that probably Covering manure pits reduce the odor coming from that manure pit. Um, that manure pit, while like noxious and it's an eyesore and it looks horrible and it's really actually good to talk about pits of manure, um, that there's a huge number of other sources of odor coming from dairies, the cows themselves, the manure, the manure when it's land applied after it comes out of the digester, um, the silage, the feed, um, puts off lots of ammonia and also VOCs and sulfur um, dioxide. So the, this is all a long way of saying there might be an incremental decrease that's assuming there isn't an increase in cows and an increased concentration of cows, which we think there is. Um, and it's very unclear what that incremental reduction is, given the many places that noxious smells are coming out of from the dairy. Great. Does anyone else want to touch on the smells and air quality question there? Well, I'll just say that any combustion whatsoever is damaging to health. I mean, this. You're going to produce all sorts of pollutants, NOx, right here. organic gases, particles, and these part, these components mixed with other chemicals that are already in the air from other pollutant sources and just exacerbate smog no matter where you are. So this is something we need to eliminate, not to enhance. And so this is why we want to eliminate combustion. We don't want any type of gas combusting, whether it's a biogas or a natural, what they call natural gas, fossil gas, doesn't matter what it is, it's going to cause health problems. And that doesn't, it's as such, it's not, it's not a clean source of energy. And it's not an acceptable source of energy. Yeah, and just one last thought, I think I mentioned it quickly, and other folks have mentioned it, but there's some hype with this technology that magically makes the manure disappear. 
right? And after it's digested, it's gone. There's still waste, right? There's still solid material that has to be applied to those fields. And, you know, Io talked about what it's like to live next to those fields or their land applying this waste. There's still odors, right? I mean, this is a, this is a technology that's focused on one aspect, right? The gas that comes off, it doesn't magically make manure and liquids just go away. Right. And I actually want to take us back. So that with that kind of smell and air quality, but I want to take us back a little bit and talk um, about more impacts and, and annou the announcement of, of this rollout. So for IO, I, the question for you that has been asked is, can you kind of share more about the Smithfield announcement of biogas and reaction and um, kind of preparation for, you know, what might be happening? Um. Yeah, um, here in North Carolina, um, you know, as I said before, we have a uh, massive amounts of uh, KFOs and um, uh, hall KFOs, and um, a lot of those being owned by Smithfield. Um, a while ago, maybe last year, um, a number of nuisance, nuisance uh, lawsuits uh, got underway, and I think um, maybe about six or seven of them have been um, held, have been decided. Smithfield's lost every one of those. Um, um, simultaneously, they're trying to do work with uh, with Duke Energy, uh, which is also a, um, a, a monopoly player in energy production here in the state. Um, a bad uh, bad player of uh, energy production here in the state, uh, I might add, uh, with their own problems of um, contamination and, um, you know, being, you know, pretty bad to the community, ripping people off. Um, they have a, a, a number, I'm not sure how many, but a number of a, a pilot projects uh, in the, here in the state. I know one is called Optima KV in the, in the eastern part of the state, capturing biogas. Um, they've gotten in, uh, in, entrenched in the, in the General Assembly as they have been for a while. This is a governing body of the state of North Carolina. It's like our Senate and House uh, to uh, write this legislation to make it harder for people to sue or gain um, uh, compensation or, or, or redress from these harms um, that they get from these from these uh, these farms. Um, Duke is also has that same standing with the General Assembly, and they've been able to write legislation. Also, they're trying to get something passed right now to make it easier for them to um, have rate increases over a five-year period without checking them in front of the North Carolina Utilities Commission. Just those, so those, those two players together, uh, and, and you know, capturing biogas and saying it's a, um, a renewable en energy is a, a farce, you know. Um, waste and poop is not a renewable energy, you know, um, just because you may take some of the smell out of it. Um, so, you know, it's just creating a huge problem here in North Carolina and the, the, the state um, elected officials are not really paying attention as they should be. Uh, the Department of North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality is um, failing, falling down on the job. Um, so we're, we're uh, keeping the pedal, the pedal um, pushed and keeping folks organized here in the state to make sure that uh, this thing doesn't happen because these farms are being permitted um, as it stands right now without an environmental justice lens, without um, a look at how um, um, these disparities are, or, or, or any disparities are happening. I'm sure they are uh, from these for these particular farms and, and how they um, impact folks um, based on um, their income levels and their um, ethnicities. So um, yeah, it's right now right now in North Carolina it's a huge problem, and um, uh, we don't want biogas coming. Uh, if it's not going to answer all those those questions and things are not going to be done with an environmental justice lens and a comprehensive, complete, you know, way of uh, doing things so that uh, folks aren't suffering. We're trying, we're not trying to shut down an industry or uh, shut down anything, but we want we want folks to be able to live in, in in health and happiness and enjoy their property. And right now, it's a it's a it's a really really bad situation. Hope that answered the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. I'm um, processing, but yeah, I, I think I think that's a that's a really good take on on an ex explanation, really, of of unfortunately the way industry operates um, across the board. And now you see two different industries, um, you know, teaming up to to use similar tactics. Um, so it's well, no secret. Uh, but I could add that um, I forgot that uh, um, Smithfield is they're 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 using the um, a narrative of, of uh, family farms. They're calling these massive pr uh, productions, these industrial oil productions, family farms. And with these nuisance suits that have been going on and uh, um, they've lost, they, they, they put the, 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 uh, the grower 
on that farm. He doesn't own the farm, but just operates it right. per Smithfield's right. instructions are, you know, um, out front and, and, you know, impending it as this environmental attack. These environmental groups are attacking these farms and trying to shut down our family farms and, right. and you know, that kind right. of thing. Yeah. And dividing, the, dividing the community on, on color lines and, and you know, and, um, and having folks scared that, that we're going after ag and what's next? Uh, corn and wheat and Right, right, right. We see, yeah, and we see this narrative in, in a lot of different states and industries. I want to toss it back and, and go a little bit more back to renewable energy with um, Dr. Mark Jacobson. So a question for you. Um, we've kind of heard this before, and thank you, Io, for, for actually um, giving us more on that. But um, biogas has been sold as this big clean energy source, and people are wondering, can we really move off fossil fuels with just the sun and wind? Won't that be so expensive? So can you speak to that? About the cost of them. Yeah. And, and sun and wind specifically. Um, well, right now, I mean, there's a transition going on throughout the United States and in the world to renewable energy. When I say renewable, clean renewable energy. So I want to distinguish between, because you'll hear the words clean, you'll hear the words renewable, and then you'll hear clean renewable. And so, and so they don't, they all mean different things to different people, but our definition is we focus on what's called clean, common, renewable energy, which is something that does, you, there's no combustion, so things that, so no biofuels, and no um, no coal with carbon capture or anything with carbon capture, and no nuclear power. So so just wind and water and solar for producing electricity and direct heat uh, for electrical devices and some hydrogen for fuel cell use. But um, so the combustion you know, is a problem, an air pollution problem, but the transition right now is going on. And because the reason it's going on so fast, actually, like for example, uh, May 5th in California, 96% of all the electricity produced in the state for one hour in California at 3.30 PM was from wind, water, and solar. I mean, there's a couple percent of biofuel in there as well, but it was 93% wind, water, solar. For five hours, it was 92%. And all day, 24 hours, it was 65%. So we're actually in the state, which has a law to go to 100% renewables by 2045, it's already a long way there. It's over 60% there on average. And I think we'll actually get to 100% by 2025 to 2028 or so. But other states are moving along too. There's several states, there's Hawaii, New Mexico, Washington State, and also Washington DC and Puerto Rico all have laws to go to 100% renewables, or in the case of New Mexico, they call it clean energy. But it's effectively going to be 100% renewables because nothing else is, is taking off some, to that degree. And there's others, like six or seven other states as well. And the reason is because the cost of wind and solar have come down so much, they're half the cost of natural gas. And they'll also be also cheaper than any type of biofuel. So it's more expensive, however way you slice it, even if you ignore the health and climate costs, uh, it's more expensive to use a biofuel or biogas uh, to generate electricity and it's cheaper to use clean renewable energy. And it's gonna even get cheaper as we go further uh, because we don't have to go, we don't have to mine for the fuel. We don't have to use biogas. You have to actually collect the fuel even and produce it continuously is whereas with wind and solar, wind comes right to the turbine, solar comes right to the panel. So there's, it's natural that you want to uh, use the, the cleanest, the safest, the least, uh, have the, things that give you the greatest energy security and uh, that will have the supplies that we know will go on forever and that you don't harm people's health. And this, you know, from a health point of view, it's four to nine million people die worldwide from air pollution. That's a huge number. It's, this, it's the second leading cause of death worldwide is air pollution. And in the US, it's about 60 to 65,000. But so this, this problem is so large, this air pollution problem is so major. I mean, it's, and today it costs more than climate change and climate change will cost more ultimately by 2050. But right now, air pollution is the number one environmental hazard. And the burning of, continuous burning of any type of fuel, like a biogas or biofuel, is just contributing to this mortality. 
And it's, it's really, there's, not, there's no need for it because there are other sources of energy that are much cleaner and more sustainable and create more energy security. Great, and I'm really glad that you you keep underscoring the air pollution um, deaths and impact. I think that's really important to keep bringing to the front here too. Um, kind of speaking of cost and, and where we are in this conversation, I wanted to actually pass it to Patty and, and ask um, the, the question that came in, can you tell us more about how factory farms and, our digest and or digesters get government subsidies, kind of how and why, and how that changes the, the cost conversation? Sure, I will not keep you here for the 14 hours it would take to elaborate all of the ways <laughs> that factory farms get subsidies um, and then digesters on top of them, but here's a short snapshot. So um, the meat industry, big ag is very good at steering agriculture policy um, and explicitly subsidies, right? Like explicit money given to their operations, um, steering lots of rules, lots of research, lots of things you could count as subsidies for this model of raising animals. They're quite good at it. Every farm bill is like a master class in how they steer money towards themselves. But there's very specific examples for this conversation about things like you know, we have a farm bill every five years, there's a lot of money in there. There's money for things like conservation programs to give grants to farms to have better environmental practices. I don't know anybody who disagrees with that concept, we have a terrible transparency problem. I think Phoebe mentioned this earlier that applies to the federal level too. But what we can figure out and what we hear from people on the ground is that they apply you know, smaller scale operations that are maybe doing pasture based animals or doing some sustainable agriculture. They apply through their state program that comes from the farm bill and they're told, oh, there's no more money left. And then we hear that Oh, there was some, this program is called EQIP. That's the acronym, E-Q-I-P. Uh, oh, EQIP money was one of the items in this package of money that helped build a digester or some manure management system for a factory farm. So we have things like that at the federal level. We have an explicit government agency called AgStar, or program that's USDA and the Environmental Protection Agency working together to promote digesters. They have a budget and they use it and they're putting it out there and helping people put these operations in place. And then we have real explicit state programs that change from state to state. So in some states they have help to cite one of these things. And we've seen that in the case studies of who pays for digesters and what package of money they used. And then the final straw I mentioned really quickly, but it's worth a second is th this, you know, this digester push is really based on the financial structure we have set up for renewable energy. And it matters how you define renewable. Right, And so lots of states, there's 30 states by our count that have some kind of renewable portfolio standard that says in our state, we have a goal, we're going to do X amount of renewable energy by this date, and then they define what's renewable. And it, when we looked in 25 of those 30 portfolios, you could do something to take animal waste and make it into energy. It always involves combustion of some kind, whether you're explicitly burning the litter from a chicken barn in an incinerator, or you're trapping methane from a, a dairy or hog lagoon and either burning it for electricity or putting it in a pipeline, 25 of those 30 portfolios gave renewable energy credits to that energy. And in fact, we've seen that even show up in the financing of one of the higher profile projects in North Carolina, where, where Duke University and Google got into the action of financing one of these digesters because they later wanted those credits that they could turn in. So the definitions matter, and we think that's a subsidy. This is not how any of us would define renewable energy, but when in a state legislature it is, money is suddenly available to drive these investments, which as we've heard are the wrong investments. So that's enough subsidy talk for late at night. <laughs> yes, um, great. So we are, we are starting to bump up against our, our hour here and we don't wanna hold you too much longer. So we have a ton of more questions that were, were put in. We're gonna work together to get those answered and hopefully in the question and answer, um, you, you got that as well. But we'd really love to get everyone involved with this work and working toward real, real as we've been defining, uh, define, defining tonight, real renewable energy and, and what that looks like um, for the, the climate solution that we actually want. So you can check out our campaigns at foodandwaterwatch.org, but also check out everyone else's organizations online to tap into the work that they're doing. And you can help us bring other organizations along into the fold, look out for um, the um, sign-on letter that will be sent around um, to get involved with all of our groups. 
Um, and also look out for companies and state governments that are trying to sell this as a miracle solution. We need everyone's eyes and ears on the ground to see where this will be expanding. So again, we'll be following up with all that information, pieces in an email soon. I'd really like to thank our allies and partners who have shared this webinar with their networks as well, especially as our speakers tonight, everyone was really incredible. So shout outs to Iowa Citizens for Community Improvement, the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy, again, Center for Food Safety, Public Justice, Friends of Family Farmers, NC Warren, Leadership Council, North Carolina Environmental Justice Network, and the Associated Association of Irritated Residents, also known as AIR. Um, so thank you again, everyone here and to our speakers for spending some of your evening with us couldn't do any of this without you. Um, we obviously have a lot of work to do, but we have a really great group of folks um, who, are, who are doing it. So um, again, thank you to our network of activists and allies. That will be it for us tonight. And thank you for joining. We'll see you next time. <laughs>